1 Samuel chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, if you will stand for the reading of God's word with me. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home, that is David, to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how many different ways you describe what a relationship with Jesus is supposed to be like. Just thinking about a knitting together of souls exemplified here in Jonathan and David's relationship. Father, I pray that you would do that work in our lives today. And Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would come in. If there's anybody whose soul has not been knit together like this with Jesus, that you would reveal it that you would expose it. God, it's so easy to think that by doing religious things that we must have a relationship with you. I think of you, Jesus, telling how in the last day people will come and say, didn't we do this for you? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do this for you? And you'll say, I never knew you. Lord, God, that there wouldn't be a single person in this church who would be confused. That every person walking out of this room today would know for certain whether their souls have been knit together with Christ or not and be able to do something. I pray, Holy Spirit, so you give me this word so my words are not enough. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come in and move in this church. Move in the heart of every single person here. Take my feeble attempt to explain your word and circumcise hearts, Lord. Bring salvation today. Give those who know you more confidence to walk in that salvation. We pray for Pastor Steve as he's traveling in the church in Brazil. We pray that you would bless that church today, bless the body of Christ there and the ministers he'll be encouraging. We pray for their travel, him and Pastor Freddie and Seth as they travel to Peru in a couple of days. We pray you bless the same way the church there, the fellowship, the ministers, build them up, Lord, keep them safe, return them to us safely. We pray over the children's ministry happening on the other side of the wall, God. We just pray for an outpouring of your spirit, God. That you would anoint the teachers to be able to teach the kids on their level. That you would supernaturally just allow those kids to behave in a way that they just wouldn't know how otherwise to calm them. And I pray that they'd be able to sense the presence of God. God, that it wouldn't just be a story they're learning, but you through the Holy Spirit, God, you would just hover over them and draw their hearts to the truth of a relationship they can have in Jesus Christ to the peace of your presence, God. We pray that you would anoint that time. I pray over the nursery, God. Even those kids who understand so little in language would just sense the peace of God on the women taking care of them. I could just sense your presence there. We pray over the youth group, God, as they hear your word, explain to them, God, that you would move in their hearts, help them to break away from the distraction of this world and be able to understand, Holy Spirit, just move, cut their hearts, Lord, that they might know you in a deeper way today. We pray for your protection over the entire service. We pray over the churches in Boston that you would protect them, that your word would go forth and bring glory to you, Lord. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, you may be seated. So, as we uh, look into the word here and, and learn about Jonathan, we have to back up and do a little introduction here. The nation of Israel was meant to be a theocracy. From time to time, the nation of Israel, uh, when it came into the land of promise, didn't do such a good job of just allowing God to be king. They would rebel against his word, and uh, God would then use different individuals at different times to get them back on track. For many years, they used as judges, such as Gideon, or the priests, like Eli. And then, finally, he brings along a prophet named Samuel. And God guided the nation through them, always bringing the nation back into focus of the law that God had given them on Mount Sinai through Moses. They were to be a nation led by God, with God as their king, a theocracy. But at the end of Samuel's life, much to his discouragement, the people demanded a king like their own nation. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7 says, And the Lord told him, that is Samuel, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And so God gave them Saul as king. Samuel chapter 9 verse 2 it says, Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, was a head taller than anyone else. Now Saul began his reign in what appeared to be humility. When God had appointed him to the prophet Samuel, it actually says that Saul was kind of afraid and he hid himself amongst the equipment. But as so often the case, sometimes what appears to be humility in time, kind of gets revealed to be insecurity. They're not the same thing. Insecurity can look a lot like humility, but time is the ultimate teller of which is which. So we find that Saul uh, turns out to be this king who ends up much more worried about how the people viewed him than how God viewed him. Through successive military victories, the nation grew very strong, and as the nation grew strong in their victories, so did the people's support of King Saul. Nevertheless, in times of testing, Saul always ultimately chose to do what pleased the people rather than obeying God. See, Saul was a, a figure who defined himself by what the people thought of him. His power was thus ultimately only political rather than a spiritual power that comes from serving an audience of one, which is God. So God sent Samuel the prophet again to Saul, saying, 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and appointed him as ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's commandments. From there we're introduced to a man named David. Told in scripture that David was a man after God's own heart. And he becomes known to Saul through his battle with a giant named Goliath. Many of you are familiar with the story. Saul had had great military victories until this giant named Goliath comes along. And ultimately that pushed Saul's army back on his heels and of course Saul is threatened because he needs to keep winning in order to keep the people's approval. So Saul promised a great prize to the man who would defeat Goliath. And that's where David shows up. Unlike the insecurity that Saul had always known, David drew his confidence from his steadfast testimony of walking with God, something that Saul never in his life ever really personally understood. So as Saul was about to send David into battle, with Goliath fearing for this young man, this is how David responds to Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36 through 37. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistines will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled, defied the armies of the living God. 
Moreover, David said, the Lord has delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Interestingly, David's own brothers uh, interpreted uh, David's response as arrogant and prideful. But notice from what he says here, his confidence is not in himself. His confidence is in his steadfast walk with the Lord. God has always delivered me. I've seen him deliver me, and he will continue to deliver me as long as I am fighting his battles. Now David, not even having the stature large enough to well Saul's armor, you may recall that Saul was worried about David, tried to dress him up in his armor, David eventually has to take it off. He's just not even a big enough man to wear that stuff. He goes out and he defeats Goliath the giant with just a sling and a stone and the great God that he knew was behind him. And after David's victory over Goliath, Saul realizes his potential and placed him in leadership over his military. And Saul drives his power from Politics, winning wars. David could be quite useful to Saul and Saul's army. But over time, the people began to notice David more than they noticed Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 7, describes what the women would sing as David would come home from battle. Saul has slain his thousands. David his ten thousands. At that point, Saul determined that David's potential was more of a threat to his political rule than actually an asset for military victories. Meanwhile, Saul also had a son named Jonathan. He also became a man that God used mightily in battle. You have your Bible open. We just read 1 Samuel 18. Let's flip over just a couple of chapters to chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14, and we'll be reading verses 6 through 15. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving, by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, do all this, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. And then Jonathan said, very well, let's, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come down to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand and this will be a sign to us. Jonathan, again, the people are in fear, trembling at these enemies of God, described as the uncircumcised here. A garrison would have been a troop of them. And Jonathan, just alone with his armor bearer, leads him and his armor bearer up to, do, to see what the Lord will do. He's not worried that they outnumber him. He knows that God is behind him. And they sort of set up this sign, which, uh, you know, asking the Lord to kind of reveal to them if they're supposed to go forward. If they say, come up, then that's a sign. So in verse 11, so both of themselves showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they have hidden. So of course, they're kind of laughing about these two guys. So then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. And Jonathan, man of faith, said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and he came after them with his armor bearer who killed them. And the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearers made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. There was trembling in the camp and the field among all the people, the garrison and the raiders also trembled. The earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. And so after that initial victory, it's almost a Goliath-type experience for Jonathan, the land trembled, 
the, the enemies of God began to be afraid and then all the armies of Israel mustered courage and went in and there was, there was a great battle uh, and a great victory that followed there. So Jonathan, <clears throat> as we see here, he is operating in the same confidence in God as David did. What is saying in 1 Samuel 14, 6, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And this confidence, not in himself, confidence in the Lord, the same confidence David had. Well, Jonathan, because of his relationship to his father Saul, favor that he had with God was actually in line to ascend to the throne of Israel. He was in line to be the next king of Israel upon his father's death. However, of course, the prophet Samuel declared that God would choose another. Jonathan agreed with God that another should be king. Turn back and read again 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 through 4. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Think about that for a minute. Here's the man who stands to essentially and take your inheritance. You would be the rightful king of Israel, and here stands before you a friend named David, going to take everything that you would inherit. Yet... Jonathan's soul is knit together with the soul of David. Some of your translations, if you look in the footnote of the New King James Version, it gives a little footnote of what this means, the soul knit together. It says, the life of Jonathan was bound up with the life of David. Woven together. Done any kind of knitting, my grandmother would crochet. My wife Emily knits. It's like they, it's just, it's inseparable. Right? souls that are being bound together in an inseparable union, so much so that for one to be blessed is to equally mean that the other is blessed. Inseparable. Their lives are completely bound up in each other. And so here we see Jonathan loving David in this way. So verse 2, Saul took him, David, that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Of course, this is before he sees Jonathan as a threat. And then verse 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David. His armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. In the sense at that time, Jonathan, of course, being a prince of Israel, he would have had the finest armor. He would have had a robe that the king's son would wear been distinct from what anyone else would wear. Wouldn't go to, uh, to battle with just any sword. The king's son would go with the best sword, the best belt to hold that sword so that it couldn't possibly fall off. He was the prize of Israel. He was the future of Israel, and he takes it all off, just gives it to David. Beautiful symbolic representation of just handing over the throne to David. This is the character of what we're seeing in the life of Jonathan. Now turn to the next chapter, chapter 19. Read with me uh, verse 1. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly. David. Now we have a conflict. Father who wants David dead, have a son completely bound up in the life of David and delighting in him greatly. So as many of you know this story, it goes on for a while, different kinds of conversations. Jonathan tries to win his father Saul over to not killing David. Saul kind of realizes it's wrong, but then the more he feels threatened by David, the more Saul gives over. And ultimately, Saul comes with a plan. He can see that he's having a hard time convincing his son, Jonathan, otherwise. He comes up with this plan to kill David at a feast. And 
In the nation of Israel, of course, there were certain feasts that were celebrated actually by law to celebrate and worship the Lord. And the, at this feast, David, being a very high-ranking official in Saul's army, David would be expected to come to the feast. In fact, David had his own seat appointed at the king's table where he would eat. Of course, David starts getting suspicious. There's a variety of things that happen. And David is sort of tipped off to the fact that Saul feels threatened by him and Saul wants to kill him. So there's a conversation that happens between Jonathan and Saul where, sorry, between Jonathan and David where David tells Jonathan, your father's trying to kill me. Jonathan is sort of like, no, he won't really do that, you know. And so they come up with a plan where David will be absent from the feast. And this is just to kind of help them figure out what the real story is here. David will be absent from the feast. The excuse will be is that he's going to go to his families for another celebration that just happens to coincide with the king's celebration. And when Saul asks Jonathan where David is, he's going to sort of say, oh yeah, David asked permission for me to go to this particular feast with my family. And based on Saul's response, they're going to be able to discern Saul's true intent uh, for David and ultimately what he plans to do. So we'll pick up with that story in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 27. It happened the next day, second day of the month, that David's place was empty. Saul said to Jonathan and his son, Why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? Jonathan an answered uh, Saul, saying, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem said, please let me go, for our family has a sacrifice in the city. My brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan and said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame, shame of your mother's nakedness? As long as the son of Jesse, which is David, lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? And Saul cast a spear at his own son to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. No food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. So, as the story goes on, Jonathan goes out, there was a predetermined place where David and Jonathan would meet. And of course, Jonathan now knows it's no longer safe for David to stay in the kingdom and David has to go on the run. And so he blesses David, sends him on his way. Uh, many of you know the story. David would be running and fleeing from Saul now for the next very many years. There's even a point where Jonathan goes out to encourage David during that time period. But David would then be on the run being chased by Saul and the army now for many years until ultimately uh, Saul dies in battle. And then, of course, David ultimately does become king. So, let's look at some of the characters that we've talked about for a minute here. King Saul, David, who eventually would become king, and Jonathan, who gives up his right to the throne to David. Saul was a man who seemed humble, became great in the eyes of a religious nation, rejected by God. But interesting how in a religious group it's possible to become great, seen and esteemed greatly amongst a religious nation or even in the eyes of a church, but to be rejected by God. He served God, didn't he? King of Israel, how could he then be rejected? Why was he rejected? Ultimately, Saul saw the, king, Saul saw the kingdom of 
Israel as his own. He should have understood that the kingdom was God's, and that God gave him, appointed him a role as king to serve the kingdom of God. His role was to govern for God. Saul never saw it that way. He always saw the kingdom as his own. God maybe could bless him or help him to maintain his power or his rule or authority. But Saul's heart, it always belonged to him. That is why Saul always chose to do what pleased the people rather than God when times of testing arose. Now David, of course, in the Bible is described as a man after God's own heart. We know that he was a great worshiper of God. He was actually known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. But for those of you who know the Bible, you also know that David committed many great sins. In fact, arguably, some of the sins that David committed would be rated as much more severe sins. He committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba, who happened to be married to one of the soldiers in David's army, fighting for David. It's adultery with her. She gets pregnant. He ultimately gives order to have her husband Uriah killed to cover up his sin. Didn't see Saul doing that. How many stories of Saul's infidelity or children outside of wedlock or those types of things. Yet, David was different in the way he saw the kingdom. David never really saw the kingdom as his own. He always saw himself as the little boy shepherd that God was with, shepherding God's nation. So even in David's great sin, he would repent. There were many times God would send a prophet to rebuke David. David would repent. Why? His kingdom wasn't his own. He'd been appointed by God. And if God sends a rebuke against me, what else can I do? Then we have Jonathan, a loyal friend of David, one who could see that David was chosen by God to take the throne, the throne that he would have sat upon by inheritance. For many years, I would read this story, and I didn't understand why, Saul, why God rejected Saul and accepted David, given David's sins were also great. But when you take a look at Jonathan in comparison to his father, you can see how utterly sinful Saul actually was. Why? Jonathan loves David and God and regards the throne and his future as unimportant in light of these relationships. See, Jonathan understood that it wasn't his father's kingdom either. It was God's kingdom. God can choose whatever king he wants. He was delighted to have his life bound up with the king that God chose. His soul was knit together with David's. His life was bound up with David's. Ultimately, God promises David, as he repents of his sin time and again, that he would bless him by bringing the Messiah through the lineage of David, Christ, the true king that God has chosen, not just to be the king over Israel, king over all the world, Recall the message from a, a week ago where uh, we read in Philippians chapter 2 about how God has given the name highly exalted and that every knee shall bow. God has chosen Jesus Christ, king over all. So, a little challenge for us is the Holy Spirit. Just been praying the Holy Spirit would search our hearts here in our church over the years, I've done a lot of ministry with people from the streets, in particular people in prison. And uh, most of those uh, guys in prison have gotten there for some pretty bad sins. And it's fairly easy to know whether any of them are walking with God. You know, they stop selling crack. Uh, they get rid of their illegal guns, stop seeking revenge. They stop being a pimp or a prostitute. Stop getting drunk or high. Yet there's another type of person, never have sold crack, shot a gun, been a pimp or a prostitute, or even smoked weed, 
never even have gotten high one time in their life. These people might have respectable jobs, lovely fami- families. They could even be just faithful to their spouses. Might attend church or even serve in ministry. They are just as much as risk of the eternal fires of hell. Hemp, killer. Or the f- How can you know if you are being deceived and you are one of the individuals? Jesus famously spoke to a person just like this in the New Testament known as the rich young ruler. I think we have it up in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. We're going to read these verses. I'll probably take a couple of slides. You can look at it in your Bible or you can read it on the screen. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Each of the man replied, I've obeyed all these commands since I was young. Looking at the man... Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Verse 24, Jesus tells his disciples how hard it is for those who trust in riches Enter the kingdom of God. So this was a man, in many ways similar to Saul, a man who would have seemed religious to all the people around him, he obeyed all the commandments. Most would have seen his wealth as a sign of blessing from God. And yet Jesus tells him to sell all he has and give to the poor. Now, does this message that Jesus gave him, is that a commandment to all believers to sell all you have and give it to the poor? No. And in fact, we find many examples of people in the Bible who had great wealth who were followers of Christ, including King David, by the way. But here, Jesus does this because he's exposing an idol in this particular young man's life. He had grown to trust and love his money more than he trusted and loved his God. So when Jesus tells him to abandon his money, Jesus is exposing the fact that he's actually violated the greatest commandment of all without even being aware of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And by Jesus telling him to sell the money, it exposed the reality loved his money more than he loved his God. As a result, this young man forfeited eternal life, forfeited treasure in heaven to enjoy his moment of wealth on earth before the torment of hell. Sounds so strange. Wasn't being a pimp. Wasn't a killer. Wasn't all those horrible things. Money is an interesting thing. It's neither good nor bad, right? It can be a blessing, but it can also become an idol. And there are many things in the life of a believer that are this way. The one I want to focus on today is our family. How do you view your spouse or your children? Are they, these are blessings that God gives us, but they can become idols. Those of you who seem to be walking in good standing in the eyes of the church, it's time for us to check ourselves. Just as Jesus checked the rich young ruler, uh, checking him on his wealth, it's time to check yourself when it comes to how you view your children or your spouse's relationship with Jesus. Have you ever felt threatened in yourself by a seemingly unexplainable experience to you that a child or a spouse has had 
where it seems that their soul has been knit to Christ, their life has been completely bound up to him, just as David's was with Jonathan's was with David. Perhaps in that moment you felt their love has even surpassed love for you. Like they love Jesus more than they love me now. Maybe you started to notice that their love for Christ was leading them to make sacrifices that you weren't comfortable with them making. Those sacrifices have left unchecked. They might destroy all your efforts, your hopes, and your aspiration for that child's future, future you wanted together with your spouse. Maybe even the reason you're at church today, although you wouldn't admit it out loud, just to keep an eye on things. You're okay with your kids learning some basic morality in Sunday school? You look at what's going on in the schools, I can see a need for some basic morality to be taught to my kids. Maybe you come here because you figure there's no harm in your wife having some nice, good, wholesome housewife friends that you find in churches. Maybe you're here because you hope this might help your husband to kind of shape up. Be like some of those Christian guys who seem to help out with the wives at home and with the kids. While you might be able to see the benefits of a church community for your family, deep down... There's a fear that you have that this religious thing might get a little out of hand. Only reasonable sacrifices would be allowable to you, only with your permission. If that describes you, then this message should be a real wake-up call for you. Because just as the rich young ruler, hell will be your final judgment. Jesus describes hell in this way. Mark chapter 9, verse 47 through 48. Talks about people being cast into hell fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Revelation 14, 11, Describes as the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. Sometimes the way I describe this to the kids in prison as I teach is... It's this place where you're burning to death, but in regular life, the one hope you might have if you were burning to death, some of the kids in Haiti have told me stories that try to discourage stealing. Sometimes they'll take a kid who steals bread and they'll put tires around his body, pour gasoline in it, and light him on fire, and the whole community watches him burning. Horrible. That would be a real deterrent to stealing. But if you were in that situation, the one hope you might have is that ultimately you'd die and the pain would stop. But hell is a place where you're suspended in a place of an eternal burning to death. You will be experiencing the full extent of burning to death, but you never ultimately die. It's an eternal death by burning. That's what it means by the idea, the worm never dies and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Yes, it could be you. Even though you've never been a pimp, or a drug dealer, or a prostitute, or a murderer, it'd end up in their judgment. How could this be possible? Why would you face the same judgment as a criminal? Well, because you're trying to deprive the ones you love Greatest love they could have. Jesus will be able to love your child and your spouse more than you ever can. Down, that threatens you. You're trying to keep religion in check. The time to repent of that wicked way of thinking and treating your family now. Yes. You too may even find the mercy of God such that your soul may be knit together with Christ's soul as theirs is to Jesus. Now there's probably some young adults in the congregation today who are going through something like this with their parents in this season of their lives. 
I forget which missionary it was, but one of them made the statement at one point, the greatest enemy to missions is Christian parents. The future your parents want for you is being threatened by what the Holy Spirit has been calling you to do. Is it possible to make both God and your parents happy? Tough one. Fortunately, the answer to that question doesn't really rest on you. It is entirely up to your parents to determine if they can be with a child, be happy with a child whose soul has been knit together with Christ. Life is bound up with him. Jonathan could never make his father, Saul, happy. Jonathan could not do it without killing David, and Jonathan would not do that. Interestingly, the Bible tells us to honor our parents, to honor our mother and father. Actually, Jonathan did that. He continued to fight in the army of Saul, not pursuing David, but he continued to fight the enemies of the Lord. And in fact, both Jonathan and Saul died together on the same hill, fighting the enemies of the Lord. Jonathan honored his father. He honored his father's position, but he could never make his father happy because he was back. Excuse me, he was bound up with Jesus. Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. Jesus makes this very bold statement. Anyone comes to me, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What does Jesus mean by that? Is he telling us to hate our parents? It could sound like that. We interpret scripture with scripture. We know that we're called to love everyone. He's describing that in comparison to your love for him. Your love for Christ should be so great that in comparison, right, you would do the very thing that a Saul as a dad would see as hateful. That's exactly what Jonathan did. I know from personal experience how difficult this can be, but I take comfort in this verse as I consider friends and family who think I'm wasting my life serving God. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16 says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I can't change my family's perspective. They listen to me very little when it comes to doctrine, but I can live it out. And they can see the fruit of my obedience and God's blessing in my life. That's my witness to them. So my wife and Emily and I had a baby five weeks ago. Thank you. And we went through several names uh, before we chose and settled on the name Jonathan. I also just want to thank you guys all so much for your prayers and all the kind support that you provided, the gifts for the baby. He has more clothes than I do now. And, um, and he needs them as much as we go through them. Some people view naming a child as prophetic, and I'm not going to speak against that. Um, but my own view with that has become jaded. You know, I've served for many years uh, working with kids in the youth prison, and I've ministered to quite a lot of Isaiah's and Elijah's and even a Josiah who've done some pretty violent, terrible things and are very far from the knowledge of God. So I'm not deceived that giving a child a particular name means that they're ultimately going to sort of get there, right? But I have noticed that children with biblical names, it's a very easy door for a Christian adult to speak into their lives. For example, a kid named Josiah can just come up to him. Your name's Josiah? Did you know there was a very great king in the Bible named Josiah? Were your parents Christians? Wow, that just opens up a whole conversation. Can you show me in the Bible where my name is? You know, and you can just talk all about it. So one of the things when Emily and I were considering, we wanted names. His name is Jonathan Elisha Burks. Another time we'll talk about Elisha. But we wanted names that other Christians would know that could be a biblical name. And so they would just feel free to go and speak into his life in whatever situation it would be. Now, both Emily and I admire the character of Jonathan. 
We both love that story of Jonathan's early leadership experience with his armor bearer, and he declares perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. And as a father, I want to see my son succeed, and I'm committed to preparing him for that goal. It's a biblical thing. But for what end will that be success be for? Well, I can be that dad who says, oh, that's my boy who touched the did the touchdown at the football game, or to be proud at his graduation of whatever educational goal he might pursue. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But the greatest desire I would have for my son would be to see him to take everything his mother and I can teach him or give to him and to watch him just take all that off and give the whole thing over to King Jesus see his soul knit together with Christ, that everything we could have possibly given him becomes Christ through his life on behalf of acknowledging him as king, determining that he will never be his own king of his own life and only Jesus' loyal subject and friend. I can't imagine anything greater for Christian parents to experience. And yet, I'm aware that there's a Saul living inside of me. I know there's going to be times where I'm going to want to guide my child by sight rather than by faith. Times where the Saul in me will want to protect him from taking risks and sacrifices associated with walking close to Christ. And I have to realize that I have the potential to become my son's own worst spiritual enemy. That name Jonathan is a good name for me because I can remember not to let my flesh, the soul that lives in me, ever persuade him to seek a kingdom for himself or to foist my own kingdom on Jonathan as that would prevent him from experiencing the day when his soul might be knit together with Christ. How can I hope to do this? The answer is in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Perhaps if we were to look at a character example of this verse played out, I can't think of a better uh, spot, you can leave that verse up, John, than in the life of Jonathan with David. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ and allow Christ to live in you? That's exactly what Jonathan did. Loved David. He took all that he had and he gave it to Jesus. He was crucified. He died to the life that he would have inherited by right. He chose to only have the life that would be bound up in the life of David. That's what Galatians 2.20 means. If I want to be a parent that doesn't uh, lead my son away from that experience with Christ, I have to first do it myself. So, will you choose to be crucified with Christ today? Jonathan crucified his future. His father had planned for him to be united with the future he had in David. So, I want to call out a few people in particular today as we give an invitation Ask to pray, you can make your way up to the front and the worship team can come up. So first I want, to, I want to speak to the young person and ask you, will you be Jonathan? The only way you can continue your walk with Christ while your parents criticize you is to be crucified with Christ. Jesus resolved to stay on the cross no matter how much he was mocked. Maybe some of you are being mocked today by your own family. What kind of mocking did Jonathan experience? His very own father. He called him a son of a perverse and rebellious woman. He said, you've chosen David, or in our situation, Jesus, to the shame of your mother. That hurts. When your parents criticize you, something you're doing for the Lord, it hurts. Will you stay on the cross with Christ through them? 
wives or husbands, either one, who are unequally yoked together with an unbeliever, or perhaps a carnal believer. There is only one day, way you can endure, and that's to be crucified with Christ. Hebrews 12.3 says, you must consider him, that is Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Stay with him. Don't get discouraged. Jesus went through the same hostility that you may be experiencing from your own spouse, your faith in Christ. Christian parents, the warning. Have you lost sight of the goal of parenting? Have you become one of those, nowadays they call them helicopter parents, hovering over your child to prevent them from sacrificing too much for the sake of the kingdom of God? Trust your own judgment more than you trust God. Time to repent of all that. Lastly, to the man or woman here who has never had their soul net together with Christ, never loved Jesus as your own soul, been close, been duct taped to Christ, Velcro to Christ, but you're always just kind of keeping the connection enough that you can just pull it apart if things get rough. It to Christ, bound up in his life, completely crucified with him. Never done that. Surrender your future, your life, your inheritance, entire kingdom to become his. Today is the day of salvation. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. God didn't send Jesus to condemn you. The words which I spoke were hard words. They weren't spoken to condemn you. They were spoken to open your eyes to see through Christ, having your entire life bound up in him, salvation. Every single person. If any of those speak to you, please come up during the worship song and, uh, and we'll pray for you. Father, I just thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this body of believers came in this morning. They sat themselves under the teaching of the word of God. Pray that you'd bless them by moving to the Holy Spirit them in the ways they need to be moved. I heard from my own heart to just pray, Father, that I would never become a Saul to my son, John. Spirit, protect me from harming him, Lord. And we all do as parents. I want to raise up a generation of young people. Know you, filled with the Spirit, young generation to declare your praise to the next father. Pray that you would help us today. To do. Let's all stand together. We want prayer. Please come up as we sing.
Great is our God. parts of that today, Lord, but let it just cut our hearts and go deep into us, Lord. And that verse in the New Testament that Eric quoted about hating your family in comparison to our love for you, Jesus. Lord, let our love for you just grow stronger and stronger, and if there is that piece of soul inside of us, Lord, would you just show that to us that can be dealt with. I just thank you for giving us your spirit. I just thank you for this word here. Let it go forth and and bear fruit as we leave this place today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you want to pray for any of this, please still come up. We're going to sing the chorus a few more times. But other than that, you are dismissed.